Today's notes is about information that led up to the drafting and ratification of the Articles of Confederation. Before we get to the first constitution that created our first government for the 13 states of the United States of America, we first need to talk about what led up to the creation of this new nation. So we have to talk about the history of the colonies and why they were so upset with British rule under King George III. Well, to begin with, we're going to go back to 1754 to 1763. This is a, a time period of conflict known as the French and Indian War. Now, when you look at the name of this war, keep in mind, the French allied with the Indians when they attacked the British. At the time, the 13 colonies were the British colonies, and so we were considered British at the time. So, let's take a look at what North America looked like in 1754. As you can see in this map of North America before 1754, you've got the different countries that control different areas of North America. And it's kind of funky looking when you look at it. Uh, the green represents the French, and the British are represented by the peach or the orange. Uh, and if you look at it, the British are in present-day Canada and on the eastern coast of America. And the French are right in between. So you can basically call this, I don't know, a, a French sandwich. So, as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is bound to create conflict. And this conflict will take place uh, over a land dispute that exists near the Ohio Valley region. In fact, George Washington will be sent by the colony of Virginia to state claim for land that the colony of Virginia claimed that they owned, that the French were occupying. So George Washington is sent out with some troops. They are able to surprise the uh, French troops, and George Washington is able to force them to retreat, which they do. And then out of necessity, George Washington realized he had to build a fort. Of course, that fort is called Fort Necessity, because he realized that the French would return, which they did. And when they returned, they actually devastated Washington's troops. They even captured George Washington. Now, rather than killing George Washington, they decided to send George Washington back to the colony of Virginia so that George Washington could tell the colony of Virginia that this land is not their land, it's French land. That's what the French wanted them to say. So, this is what led to the conflict between the French and the British colonists. So it's interesting here when you notice it was the colonists that started this conflict. Well, as you can imagine, after this war comes to a conclusion in 1763, the French are basically going to be kicked out of all of North America, except for a tiny little island they'll later come to hate, Haiti. Um, so let's take a look at what uh, North America looks like after the French and Indian War concluded in 1763. Here it comes. Wait for it. Wait for it. As you can see, the French were basically kicked out of all of North America except for that tiny little island called St. Domingue, which is also today called Haiti. Well, as you can imagine, after this war comes to a conclusion, the British government is now going to have to pay for the costs of the war. Well, who best to help pay for the cost of the war than the people that started the war? That would be the colonists. So the British will begin to tax the colonists uh, taxes that they weren't used to paying. So that is the significance of the French and Indian War. It's interesting that what uh, started the conflict was a land dispute between the British colonists and the French. It concludes with the French being devastated and losing the war and being kicked out of almost all of North America. But the biggest uh, conclusion of this, the biggest factor is that the British are now going to be forced to have to pay for all the debt that they incurred during the war, about 140 million pounds in debt. So now they're going to expect that the colonists be the ones that pay for that war. So this is what you've probably been taught uh, when you're in elementary, junior high, and high school, that this began to upset the colonists because they are going to be taxed by the British king who exists in London in Great Britain. And their biggest complaint, you've probably been told, 
is that they're being taxed by a government in which they have no representation. In other words, they don't get to elect anyone to represent their interests in Great Britain. Yes, this is one of the concerns, no taxation without representation. But I would argue it was more than just the taxes being imposed on the colonists. In fact, I would argue the biggest complaint was all the injustices done to the colonists by the king. So let's take a look at some of the injustices done to the colonists by the king. First one I'd like to talk about is, well, what if you criticized the king? What if you called him names or said that uh, he was doing a bad job and it wasn't beautiful like he said it was? Well, clearly you could be punished and convicted for criticizing the king or even publishing material that criticized the king. So as you can imagine, there was no freedom of speech or the press uh, for the colonists when they criticized the British government. Another biggest complaint they had was uh, their right to own guns and firearms and gunpowder without it being confiscated by the British king. This is where you hear about the Lexington and Concord uh, attack. The British troops went to Lexington and Concord because they knew that there was a stash of weapons and ammunition in Lexington and Concord, and so they wanted to confiscate those warehouses that existed there. Well, as you can see here, the national government had the ability to take away firearms and gunpowder uh, during the colonial period. Another major criticism had to do with the Quartering Act. Now, there were two Quartering Acts. Now, let's just remember, once the French were kicked out of North America, you still have several Native Americans that were living in the western part of America. And as the British colonists continue to want to move westward, they're going to have conflicts with the natives. Well, that would require the British continually sending troops to protect them from native attacks. Well, where are those troops going to live when they're being sent from Great Britain? Great Britain requested that uh, the, the British colonies pay for the housing of these troops. But as you can imagine, the American colonists refused to provide funding to build barracks for troops. So then the British king passed a second quartering act. Now he required, look, if you can't uh, provide funding for the housing of troops, then you're going to have to be forced to house troops in your own homes. Well, this is where you get the idea of quartering troops in people's homes during peacetime. Well, that upset the colonists. Next, the Stamp Act would show that someone paid taxes on certain official documents. Those official documents could be pamphlets, newspapers, diplomas, marriage license, even playing cards. With uh, a stamp affixed to these documents, it would prove that you actually had paid your tax on these items. Well, this is a new tax that the Americans weren't used to paying and they didn't like it. Um, but that was not the only problem. It was a way that this law was going to be enforced by the British uh, officials. The British officials were given a type of search warrant called a writ of assistance. These writs of assistance allow these British officials to go to someone's home and allow them to look through any part of their property looking for any possible item that they did not pay their stamp tax um, for an item that they purchased. As you can imagine, this was easily abused by British officials, uh, creating uproar among the colonists who were upset uh, that you had these British officials going into people's homes with these writs of assistance without telling them what they're looking for and without telling them uh, where they expect to find it. So that was another major injustice done to the colonists by the king. Furthermore, uh, the Navigation Acts, which had been passed in the uh, 1760s, basically required that any uh, American sailor or shipper or merchant who is going to trade with other countries must use an American uh, British ship or a British port to conduct business. Well, as you can imagine, there were several of these sailors, these merchants that refused to abide by the Navigation Acts and they would get caught in violation of, of the Navigation Acts. And in other words, they were smuggling and they would have to face what's called an admiralty court. Sometimes they were called vice admiralty courts. These courts uh, basically required that you had to prove 
your innocence, that you were guilty until you proved your innocence. In addition, there was no trial by jury. You had to basically uh, defend yourself against the judge, and it was up to the judge to determine if you would if you would be considered guilty or not guilty. Now, keep in mind, these British judges are being paid by the British government. So they're inclined to go ahead and determine guilt much more often than innocence. Okay, so that was Navigation Acts. Um, now, in response to the Boston Tea Party that took place in 1773, that was over a protest of the Tea Act, uh, you had the British government respond by passing the Intolerable Acts, which further restricted the liberties of the colonists. They included closing down the Port of Boston, restricting town hall meetings, which is a form of direct democracy where the people got together to vote on certain policies of the area. And also, this is interesting, British soldiers, if they were accused of criminal acts, they would have to face trial in Great Britain, not the colonies. So there they would face a jury, not of colonists, but a jury of British citizens in Great Britain. Now, the reason why I listed all these injustices done to the colonists by the king, because I wanted you to also see how this will influence some major civil liberties that they will add to our future U.S. Constitution. As you noticed, I put down numbers here because they reflect the numbered of the Bill of Rights. First Amendment, freedom of speech and the press. Second Amendment, right to bear arms. Third Amendment, no quartering troops during peacetime. Fourth Amendment, no unreasonable searches and seizures. Fifth Amendment, uh, right to remain silent, protection against self-incrimination. Sixth Amendment, right to an attorney, right to uh, counsel, right to an attorney, right to a trial by jury, right to a fair trial, right to a public tri trial. Those are all parts of the Sixth Amendment. So I want you to see a lot of the injustices done to the colonists by the king will also influence the writing of the Bill of Rights, which I will note came after the Constitution was ratified. We'll get to that later. All right, now that we've labeled all the injustices done to the colonists by the king, now you can imagine the, the colonists were ready to go ahead and declare independence from Great Britain. Well, the best way to do it is to write a document called the Declaration of Independence. This document was written by uh, Thomas Jefferson, or as I like to say, TJ, he's the man. He wrote the Declaration of Independence, and he was heavily influenced by a British philosopher named John Locke. John Locke had tremendous influence on what Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence. In the uh, beginning paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson will use Locke's ideas about the purpose of government, in which he will say, no government should violate natural rights. There are certain rights that no government should violate. John Locke said that includes your right to life, liberty, and property. Thomas Jefferson said that would include your right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In addition, John Locke, when he wrote this, by the way, he wrote this in his treatise on government uh, back in the uh, 1600s. He also included that no government should exist unless it has consent of the governed. Well, Thomas Jefferson's going to argue the British king lacks consent of the governed. In fact, there's no representation in the British government for the colonists. And I would also suggest that consent of the governed is just another way of defining legitimacy. You know, legitimacy. This is when people consent to an institution's right to rule over them. And then finally, John Locke would argue that every government that exists should be limited in scope and in power. And if it doesn't have limits in its power, it could, be, it could lead to abuse of power. Well, that's exactly what Thomas Jefferson will also write, that all governments in the world should be limited in their power, otherwise it will lead to abuse of power. So, uh, limited government is something that all governments should have. Now, interestingly, was who was Thomas Jefferson actually writing to when he wrote the Declaration of Independence? Now, if you actually read the Declaration of Independence, you will see that the majority of the document, he is listing all the injustices done to the colonists 
by the king. In fact, most of the paragraphs begin with, he has. If you go and look at the Declaration of Independence, you'll see he's criticizing all these actions, all these injustices done to the colonists by the king. And the question now is, well, who is he writing to? Is he writing to the average farmer living in the colonies who could barely read or write? I doubt that very seriously. In fact, Thomas Jefferson is writing to the educated elite in other countries. He's writing to the leaders of France, the leaders of Spain, hoping they will come to our assistance and help us in this fight against the British government. In addition, he is also talking to the parliamentary leaders in Great Britain, basically telling them, look, if the king is treating us colonists, us British citizens like you, if he's treating us with these injustices, what's going to stop him from treating you living in Great Britain the same way? So who is his audience? It's not your average Americans. He was actually writing to world leaders. He was, it was a message to the world, to France, to Spain, come to our aid as we fight against the British king. It was also a message to the British parliament and their leaders, letting them know that, look, he will treat you with injustice just like he's treated the British colonists with injustices. Now, once they declare their independence, this is when they're now going to begin to draft the Articles of Confederation. They will be drafted in 1777. And what's interesting when you look at the dates here, drafted in 1777, but it doesn't get ratified until 1781. So that begs the question, why did it take so long to get the Articles of Confederation to be ratified? Well, the answer to that is all 13 states, all 13 colonies, which are now states, had to ratify the Articles of Confederation. It took four years before that could be accomplished. Well, that was one of the many problems that existed under the Articles of Confederation. But let me remind you, when they wrote the Articles of Confederation, the 13 individual states wanted to create a national government that was much weaker than the national government that existed under Great Britain. In fact, many of them believed that the state should have sovereignty and maintain their independence, but we just need a national government to keep us together, to align and to fight if we are attacked by outside forces. So, the Arles Confederation will be written. It's going to give most of the sovereignty to the states, and that's become a major problem. So let's look at the major problems that assist that let's look at the major problems that existed under the Articles of Confederation. First, the ratification. Well, the Articles of Confederation needed all 13 states to ratify this Constitution. Now, keep in mind, I wrote down ratification of the Constitution because the Articles of Confederation was the first Constitution. Our U.S. Constitution was our second Constitution. And interestingly, they decided when they wrote the second Constitution to only require nine states. That's right, nine ratify the Constitution. So, that was one of the major problems, how the Articles would be ratified. Next, what about national institutions? Well, when they wrote the Articles of Confederation, they only created one branch of government, and that was Congress. Only Congress was created to basically write laws, which is interesting. You have a Congress that's going to write the laws and write policies, but it's going to be up to the states to enforce those policies. Why? Because there was no executive branch to enforce the laws. Another interesting feature, there's no federal court system that would exist to resolve disputes between the states. So if two states have disputes over boundaries or uh, water rights uh, or over trade, you don't have a U.S. court system, a national court system, to resolve those disputes. Next, making laws and amendments. Uh, making laws would be difficult because it would require a supermajority of nine of the 13 uh, states to agree. Now, when I say nine out of 13 states, the Congress gave only one vote to every state, regardless of size. So if uh, there's a vote on a policy in Congress, uh, each state got one vote, regardless of size. It would require nine out of the 13 states to pass a law which, if you think about it, 
doesn't really matter because they can write a law, but it's up to the states to enforce it. Next, what if you want to make a change to the Articles of Confederation? How many states would have to ratify that change? Well, the Articles of Confederation required all 13 states would have to ratify the amendment. I wonder if you can imagine how many amendments were added to the Articles of Confederation. That's right, zero. It was difficult, if not impossible, to get all 13 states to ratify it, uh, to ratify any change to the Articles of Confederation, which is interesting. When they wrote the U.S. Constitution, they realized that was a problem and only required that amendments need ratification by three-fourths of the states. Now, we do have 27 amendments that have been added to the U.S. Constitution, uh, which some people would argue is not that many over a 220-year period, but under the Articles of Confederation, there were no amendments added to the Articles of Confederation. Another major problem of the Articles of Confederation was relations among the states. They just were having economic problems with one another, especially when it came to trade. Think of it this way. Let's say you're Lumberjack Jack, and you're trying to trade timber, wood, uh, lumber, with uh, another state. So you're from New York, you go to Connecticut, and uh, you're trying to sell your lumber to Connecticut. Well, Connecticut, if it wanted to, could confiscate your wood, which is exactly what some states were doing to one another. They were confiscating goods coming from other states. If they weren't confiscating it, they were taxing it. Well, if Connecticut's going to do that to New York, what do you think New York's going to do when you have a Connecticut merchant trying to trade goods in New York? They're going to do the same thing. They're going to confiscate their goods or they're going to tax those goods a very high tax. So you're going to have major problems, conflicts between the states because you don't have a national government or a court that could step in to resolve these disputes. Finally, relations with other nations. We were called the ugly duckling of the world. Uh, Spain was not allowing our farmers to do trade in the port of New Orleans. Britain was keeping uh, forts and troops on American soil, and our national government was too weak to confront these foreign countries and force them to address our issues. And then finally, the relationship between the national and state governments. Since the national government was so weak, it could not impose its will on the states. The basics here to understand how much of a problem this was, how about the ability to tax? Yes, Congress can levy tax, uh, well, I shouldn't even say that. Congress would, would try to request that the states collect taxes uh, uh, for the national government. Well, if you make it a request and not a requirement, many states would refuse to give the amount that the national government was requesting. In fact, Rhode Island didn't give any tax money to the national government. In fact, the national government only received about one-fourth of what it was requesting from the states. So that's a big problem when you have a national government that doesn't have the power to levy taxes. Well, if you don't have the power to levy taxes and you don't have the power to raise and maintain a national military, that is also a problem. In fact, all 13 states had their own state militias and the national government did not have the power to raise its own national military. Well, this becomes a major problem when you look at an event that takes place in 1786. It's called the Shays Rebellion. Daniel Shays was a farmer in Massachusetts. He had actually risked his life as a soldier in the American Revolution. When the revolution came to an end, he went back to his farm in Massachusetts. He, like many farmers, were being required now to pay taxes on their property with hard currency like gold or silver. Well, a lot of farmers don't have a hard, uh, hard currency to pay their taxes. So many of them were going to court uh, requesting that the state uh, give them a reprieve, that the state back off on requiring hard uh, currency for their taxes. Well, when they were taken to court, um, and this is where you see this picture, that's why this picture is located here, what type of uh, house do you think that is on the left corner. Well, that upper left corner house is a courthouse watching this conflict that's taking place because you have a farmer who probably had his farm foreclosed upon, ordered by a judge, attacking a judge and trying to uh, 
drown him in the river. Well, this is what was taking place throughout the, the state of Massachusetts. Farmers were rebelling against the decisions of, of justices, of judges, who were deciding to foreclose on their property because they couldn't pay their property tax. So, Shea is, Shays is going to lead a rebellion. Well, the first thing you would think is, all right, well, Massachusetts has a rebellion on its hands. Who's it going to call? Don't say Ghostbusters. It's going to call their state militia, right? Except here's the problem. Who makes up the state militia? That's right, the farmers, the ones that are rebelling. Since they were the ones rebelling, you couldn't call the state militia. Well, how about you call the national military to come in and intervene? Unfortunately, there is no national military. So, curiously, how did Shea's Rebellion come to an end? Interestingly, the wealthy elite of Massachusetts had to hire a private militia to put down Shea's Rebellion. Now, why is this such an important event? Two reasons. First, you're a leader in another state. The, you're part of the economic elite. You see what's going on in Massachusetts. What's your first concern? Oh no, the farmers in our state might try to rebel. We might have to face our own rebellion. Well, that is one concern. But many of the uh, wealthy elite in the states had a bigger concern. They feared that many state legislatures, to avoid a rebellion, would start printing up currency to devalue the, 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 how much currency is worth so that farmers could pay their taxes and pay their debts. Well, that's great if you're a farmer who's in debt, but if you're the wealthy elite who they owe money to because you own the local store in which they borrowed money to uh, provide to pay for their seeds or their, their farm tools to, to work on the farm, and they owe you money, you don't like the idea that they're going to be paid back or that you will be paid back with money that's not worth what it used to be. So the second concern is that the wealthy elite were concerned. And these wealthy elite were bankers, creditors, moneylenders, merchants. They feared that their state legislatures would give in to the demands of debtors by simply printing more money so that those debtors could pay their tax is that those debtors could more easily pay off their debts. Who does that hurt? The creditors, merchants, bankers, moneylenders. And guess who's going to meet in Philadelphia to write a new constitution? Well, to try to revise the Articles of Confederation. It's going to be your bankers, your creditors, your moneylenders, your merchants. These are the people that will eventually meet to Philadelphia, in Philadelphia, for the purpose of trying to make changes to the Articles of Confederation. But I'm going to ask you this. When they do meet in Philadelphia in 1787, and they are ordered by their states to make revisions to the Articles, even if they come up with great ideas of how to change the Articles of Confederation, what is the requirement to get it ratified and added to the Articles? That's right. Unanimous consent. All 13 states. That would be difficult, if not impossible. So, rather than writing some amendments to add to the Articles, they decided to start writing a whole new Constitution. And that's what will bring an end to the Articles of Confederation when they decide to scrap what some people would say, that piece of crap, and start writing a whole new Constitution.